so I'm Will Harris. Uh, I work for a company called Design That Matters. Um, and what I'm going to be going over in this presentation is a little bit different from what everyone else has been talking about. It's a little bit about what we do and using one of our latest projects as kind of a case study. Um, so what do we do? We are a design firm that designs uh, devices to help people in, in the developing world. We're a design consultancy. We don't um, produce the items ourselves. We help set up different features. Uh, we work on a variety of different things, products to, um, but in the past, let's say five or six years, we focused mainly only on infant healthcare devices. And who do we work with? Um, we work with all of the variety of different stakeholders you deal with in these types of environments. You deal with the secretaries of health, you deal with um, all the doctors, you deal with nurses, you deal with mothers if you're de doing uh, neonatal care, you deal with the guy who's bringing all the medical equipment to the hospital and to the person who's servicing it. And how do we do this? What we try to do is we try to have a process that breaks down all the cultural barriers um, and language barriers that you run into when you're working in a developing world context. We use very interactive things like cards that have English and the local language on there as well as pictures. So ways that we can kind of bridge the gap between the interpreter, um, or kind of get rid of the interpreter in a sense. Um, a lot of times when you're working these, I'm sure a lot of you guys always see a question, and they'll give the translator a very, very long 30 second response, and the translator will turn to you and say, no, they don't like it. And what's, what's kind of missing in there? So we try to find, find ways to get past that. So uh, to, I'm going to use uh, our latest project, uh, Project uh, example. So when we go through the next step, every local part, interviewing people with these cards and trying to get you know really precise information based upon pointed questions. Um, the observational actually is some of the most telling a lot of times. It's where you just be a fly on the wall. So this is me watching them use a phototherapy device uh, in rural Vietnam. So be a, fly, uh, be a fly on the wall, document as much as possible. Watch how people interact with different objects in different situations. Um, you can imagine me when I go into a Vietnamese hospital, uh, I'm about a foot and a half taller than everyone else. I stick out a little bit, especially when I've got a camera strapped to my face. People are staring at me, and they don't want me to be taking pictures. Um, after being there for about five to six hours, people just start ignoring you, and they don't really care what you're doing. And that's when you really see how people interact with things. That's how you see actual use case scenarios, as opposed to what people are going to tell you they do. Um, a lot of times you can ask someone, you know, do you think this will work well in your hospital? And they'll say, oh yeah, it'll work beautifully. We totally understand how to use this. And then you ask them, what about the hospital over there? And they're like, oh no, they're idiots. This seems very complicated for them. They don't know how to figure it out. So it's, it's how do you kind of get the information you need um, without pushing too much? So this gets to some more of that direct research. We do things like renderings of products to get feedback from everything from the UI, the user interface, of how you turn on the buttons, um, to how they would uh, interact with things. So this is uh, some more of that direct research. Um, this is a rural hospital, Mok Chow, um, in northern Vietnam, uh, that they're doing a group sort right there. This is a really important hospital to us. This was the f where the first unit was uh, actually distributed. So yeah, you, you compare observational and direct research um, after you've gone through that whole process. So you can see here, this is a bassinet. Um, this is where the baby would lay. And there's some specks of dirt up here that may be a little hard to see, but it's, it's pretty gross in there. And we were told we clean the bassinet every day. Well, we went in an hour after they opened, so it was very obvious that they didn't clean the bassinet every day. So how do we find design solutions that can kind of get around cleaning the bassinet every day, make it easier, make it something that even if they don't do, it's not as much of a problem. So then we synthesize our research. So designers are known to love post-it notes. We just cover walls in them. And we take all of that learning that we've had, all that direct and observational research, and we plaster it on a wall and we create different frameworks from it. And then we create kind of the most crucial statement of the whole project, which is a point of view statement. Um, it's something that I think we do a little bit uniquely, where we talk about what problem we're going to address and what we're not going to address. Um, 
as a designer, when I was doing uh, freelance work before I joined Design That Matters, everyone would come to me and say, I want the iPhone of this. I want the iPhone of speakers. I want the iPhone of a, uh, like a bike seat. And it's just, what does that even mean? Um, so you get people that want a device that does everything. Um, when we were first thinking about this, our partner was like, well, you know, maybe it can go in an ambulance. Maybe it can go in a rural setting. Maybe it can go in a, in a regular hospital. And maybe it can go in an airplane if they need to have phototherapy. And it's like, no, 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 let's back up here. Like, what are we going to do really well? We could do a lot of things kind of poorly, but we really want to focus on what we can do very well. So for us, that point of view statement is something we create in the beginning. and It's a guiding light, in a sense, throughout the whole project. And then we engage with the users. So what we do is we create models. We create different things, physical objects for people to interact with. Um, in the US, when you're doing product design research, you can bring a cardboard box and give it to someone and say, hey, imagine this is a cell phone that has all these different gadgets on it, and it's got a Swiss Army knife that pops out. And people are like, that's so cool. I like this feature. I like this feature. I don't know about that one. In Vietnam, if you bring a cardboard box with someone to, and you say, this is a cell phone with a Swiss Army knife in it, they're like, you're crazy. What are you doing here? Please get away from me. <laughs> so having something that actually looks like the device that we're trying to, to give, something that actually they can interact with and give us very important feedback. Like this right here, a doctor was saying, oh, the bassinet, that area where the baby goes, is way too small. You know, I think it should be bigger. And we're like, okay, great. Show us. Here's a tape measure. Please, like, show us exactly how big you think it should be. And after a few different iterations of that, you get a much better solution where you don't design the product yourself. You let this wonderful group of people that you're working with help you to design that product. And you use that as kind of a guide um, when you're actually making the design. So create full-size uh, prototypes. And one of the fun things that we, we try to do is we do a dream your own, or create your own dream device where we have paper after we do a whole bunch of uh, different interviews with them and show them different devices we know of. And we have them draw up, doctors, nurses, even mothers, what they think the best design would look like. And you get some really goofy concepts, but you can get some really interesting, uh, rich feedback from that. So these are some of the, the renderings that we create to kind of put things in context. Um, and you know, this is some nurses playing with the buttons and having a, a great time with one of our looks like prototypes. And then lastly, we collaborate with your partner. So for us, we, we don't believe as much in value engineering for the developing world. A lot of people have seen ER, especially when, yeah, when you're talking about medical devices. People in the developing world trust medical devices that look like medical devices. They look like something that is robust, trustable, and to get that kind of aesthetic, you need to use certain processes in manufacturing. And sometimes some of these local manufacturers that we work with don't know exactly how to do that. They know the capabilities in their country, but they just don't know some of the technical difficulties in there. So what we do is we bring a whole bunch of volunteers that we have. Um, and we bring them in from all these different design firms throughout the Boston area. And we have these workshops where we teach them how do you do injection molding? When you're inspecting a part, how do you look at it to make sure it's correct? How do you go back to the manufacturer and talk to them and think about, oh, this should be changed a little bit in this way? So kind of setting them up. So even after the project that we're working on now, they can then bring those processes to their other products. Um, and in this process, we think about, you know, hey, are you doing low volume manufacturing? Are you only doing a few units? What are the best ways to do that? Are you doing high volume? You know, these are kind of the costs associated with that. So giving them a really nice, in-depth uh, bit of information about that. So these are some drawings we created for them showing, you know, redesign issues based upon manufacturer um, recommendations to help them kind of get more uh, acquainted with it. And then they actually, after giving them all this wonderful research and you know, giving them a lot of this uh, education on how these processes work, they were able to start making things their own. So this is the MTTS headquarters. They're making the Firefly uh, circuit boards right there. And here's one of their workers uh, bending the tubes for the device. 
And then this is actually the injection molding tooling, getting all set, ready to go. Doing the actual final checking of the devices to quality test. And for us, this was an amazing photo. After three years of work, having the units actually shipping. And then this is the Vietnamese team that, that helped really make this happen um, with the first production unit. So what are kind of the insights we got from this project that I think really translate to a lot of different devices out there in the developing world, especially medical devices. So aesthetic. Uh, I know I mentioned that a little bit earlier, but these are the devices that MTTS, our manufacturing partner, currently create. It's a warmer, an inf infant warmer and a CPAP machine. So they are, from what we've done and the testing that we've done, probably some of the best devices on the market worldwide based upon how well they actually treat a lot of conditions. But they look like they're out of a Soviet era design. It, it looks very boxy, looks kind of unsafe, looks a little scary. People just don't trust it. People watch ER, they know what a medical device looks like. This is a top of the line device. And so what you run into is you run into a lot of people in the developing world, they'll have this donated piece of equipment from, that has been used in Japan for a while and somebody gave it to Vietnam. So they've got that next to an MTTS piece of equipment and everyone runs the Japanese device and want to put their baby under it. And that de device has actually been broken for the past three months. So it doesn't really even work, but people want to get to that. People want to bribe the doctor, even though it's a free system so they can use that device. And that's an issue that MTTS has been having. So what we tried to do is say, how do we bring kind of the cost that you guys are trying to go for in the design of these devices, but still create that aesthetic, that aesthetic of trust? So we try to do that with Firefly by incorporating different plastics and you know, more soft organic forms. Next, hard to use ROM. So this is a traditional phototherapy device being used in Kenya. It's, uh, you just have one big light over a baby and it's an adjustable uh, head, very much like a microphone stand over there. And um, it just sits there over the baby. This is how it's actually used in a lot of the developing world. This is the Philippines. Um, there are very limited resources and they want to treat as many kids as they can as possible. But I don't think shoving six kids underneath one device uh, where you have a lot of inf spread of infection is going to give you the results you want. And here's an example of that. So this is a light uh, diagram of the, how intense the light is from a phototherapy device. And this is the recommended use. This is actually from a uh, product manual of, of how you're supposed to be using the device. And this is what happens when you actually shift the light around and you put multiple kids underneath it. The darker the color, the more light intensity it is. So you'll notice that the kid in the middle is the only one that's getting really any phototherapy at all. And then you have infection being spread, or early love, <laughs> your <laughs> choice. Um, so what we tried to do is we created a device where the bed was built into the device, um, and the light was built into it as well. So you can't reposition the light so it goes a different way. It's always going to be directly in the way that we wanted it to. And the bed is uniquely small enough to fit only one child. I mean, you could do two, but it's going to look really weird. Um, so it, really trying to make it so it's hard to use wrong. You can't adjust anything. It's just there. You just put a baby in and it works. Um, there's nothing else you need to do with it. So this is the light of overhead phototherapy in the developing world, and this is Firefly. So it is lighting from above and below. Um, we found that a lot of times, because a baby has to be um, completely naked when they receive phototherapy, parents want to put blankets on them because they look cold. Well, that's great, but they're not receiving any uh, therapy because they're not getting any light. So by putting a light underneath, if a parent does put a blanket on top of the child, they're still, still going to be receiving effective phototherapy from below. And then lastly, durable. So if any of you guys have spent time in the developing world and seen, gone to a hospital, you know of the graveyards that are out there. There are all these donated equipment graveyards that are sitting everywhere. Devices just break down. They don't work very well. Um, 
especially they're designed for an air-conditioned environment, this first world environment that is just not gonna happen out there. Um, there's a story that we like to say that if, if you haven't had a cockroach crawl into your device and pee all over the circuit board, then you haven't tested it for the developing world. <laughs> so here's the, uh, someone just carrying it. Um, so this is, for me, a pretty special moment. Um, in the back there, th this is when East Meets West was first going into implementing devices in the Philippines. Um, they had just, the week before, shipped all of these warming devices and they have phototherapy devices in the back. I think it was over 100 units in all. It was really exciting to finally get into the country and uh, we, we were tagging along and we were just gonna show Firefly. We heard that in the Philippines, you know, it's a lot more strict. You can't actually put babies in the devices, um, you know, until you get an okay from the higher ups and you know, that, that would take a while. So don't expect to ever actually treat a baby with this device right now. Um, just kind of get the reaction. So, you know, I, I brought it out and people were interested. They thought it was, you know, really nice looking and they, they thought it was interesting. But then they grabbed the bassinet and they said, you know, this piece of plastic just seems not really durable. You know, we need something that you can really beat up because, you know, look at our graveyard in the back. So I took one hand and put it behind my back and crossed my fingers and I grabbed the bassinet and I threw it against a concrete wall and it didn't break. And immediately they said, let's use it. And it was the first East Meets West device to treat an infant in the Philippines. Um, so that shows you kind of the power of creating something that really is durable and trustable. Um, and, and integrating that into your design process. So quickly, I'm gonna go off to some results to date. Um, we found a 40% reduction in treatment time uh, out of all other phototherapy devices on the market. Pretty excited about that. Uh, it's been in over eight hospitals. We're still in the early stages. Treated over 130 infants. Actually, this is an old number. Right now, we're over 250. So pretty excited about that. And we have 60 plus units distributed. So all in all, it's pretty good. I hope you enjoy the presentation.